So if you guys haven't heard or checked out my timeline video about the Game of Thrones world, this story has 12,000 years worth of lore packed into it. But lucky for me, the Iron Throne has only been around for 300 years. A relatively small amount of time. It was created by the character who conquered the continent where the majority of our story takes place. Aegon the Conqueror, a dragon rider whose bonded beast actually used its flames to forge the Iron Throne that every king since has sat on. Though repeatedly mentioned to be ridiculously uncomfortable since it was made with the swords of his enemies, a decent amount of notable characters have coveted everything it represents. All the power over the seven kingdoms that comprise the realm. Ned having sat on it in place of robber while he was out during a hunt gives us some more insight in his POV chapter. Adding the possibility that the whole story about Beleriand the Black Dread using his dragonfire to forge it might just be what the singers have been going around telling people to make for a spicier song. The metal beneath him had grown harder by the hour, and fang steel behind him made it impossible to lean back. A king should never sit easy, Aegon the Conqueror had said, when he commanded his armorers to forge a great seat from the swords laid down by his enemies. Damn Aegon for his arrogance, Ned thought sullenly, and damn Robert and his hunting as well. Well, regardless of how it was forged, people want it, some even accomplishing this goal, like Aegon Targaryen's younger son, Maegor the Cruel, who forcibly took it for himself and fought for the rest of his life trying to hold it. And then one day, he was found dead on the same Iron Throne after holding it for six years. Almost the entire realm was against his rule, and during his final war council, he decided to stay back in the throne room to be alone. The next morning, he was found dead with wounds from the blades that comprised the Iron Throne. It's left up to readers whether we believe he took his own life or not. The show made this chair look all safe and perfectly sculpted, but this is actually how George Martin envisioned his creation for the story can barely even call it a chair. Most were never as successful as Magor, becoming king as close as some did come. After Magor, the crown returned to the designated heir, Magor's nephew and Aegon the Conqueror's grandson, King Jaehaerys. And this character would rule for so long that he outlived all of his heirs. In 101 AC, Jaehaerys, now called the Old King, had to decide how to peacefully transition power without causing any wars. That's just how coveted this amount of power is. The safest route was to hold a great council and just have the realm's nobles decide for themselves in a vote which Targaryen has the best claim. Inviting every lord around the continent brought up one issue. How long will they have to wait for everyone to arrive? This is one chunky continent and it's not like there's motorized vehicles around in this primitive setting. Look at the old king's face, time was ticking. After a waiting round for six months, the great council of 101 AC was underway. The largest castle in Westeros, Harrenhal, had to be used even though Aegon the Conqueror melted most of it during his campaign. No other location could hold a thousand lords and whoever else they were along for the journey. Fourteen candidates were put forward with their claim. This could have gone messy, but the majority were opportunistic bums trying to get rich quick. A lot of unnamed bastards and random characters claiming Targaryen lineage. After they were all weeded out, two were left. The old king's grandson, named Viserys, and a great-grandson named Lenor. Both sides had armies forming, and even though Lenor's last name was Valerion because it was his mother that was a Targaryen, it seemed like he may have had a chance because of who his father was. A legendary figure in the lore during this era, Corlys Valerion, who traveled this world and amassed an insane amount of wealth through trade, becoming the richest guy in Westeros, and he wanted his boy on that throne. Corlys was generous with all his gold, but it didn't help. Not because of the Valerion name behind him, came down to Lenor stemming from the female line, several times. Though some of the bigger houses did back his claim, like the Baratheons and Starks, he was outvoted 20 to 1 against Viserys. The Valerions weren't happy, but with all that support backing Viserys, leaves little room to work with. But Lenor almost sat on the Iron Throne. Oh, and he was 7 during the Great Council, and grew up to be interested in men, so his line of the family wouldn't go very far anyways. When Viserys was selected to be the next king, he was already married with a daughter, but his marriage would only bring him that one child. Before his wife died from childbirth complications, the Great Council of 101 AC set the precedence of male line inheritance, but Viserys declared his daughter his rightful heir since he had no other sons, and his younger brother's open ambition was aiming for the throne which he didn't like very much. Lenor Valerion would end up being betrothed to the heiress, Rhaenyra, mending old wounds between House Valerion and Targaryen so it looked like he may be king after all. King Viserys would also remarry and successfully have some sons with his second wife, but he was adamant on his daughter still taking the throne after him. And Viserys' younger brother wasn't done trying to wiggle his way into power. 
Lenar was killed by a close companion, who was really his male lover. And the lore hints that Viserys' brother, Prince Daemon, may have hired that man to assassinate him because of how clean the getaway was. Next thing you know, Daemon secretly marries Rhaenyra before King Viserys could stop it. Yeah, they were niece and uncle, but that's just the Targaryen way. Daemon and Rhaenyra thought they were all sneaky, but the real devious one was Viserys' second wife, who crowned her son right after Viserys' death. And everyone just went with it because it was better than having a girl on the throne. Rhaenyra was robbed, but wouldn't just sit back and take it. For two years, a civil war took place, with the family split in two as well as the realm. Rhaenyra would take King's Landing for a few months away from her half-brother, but the capital would soon turn on her. There was no real winner in this war, because both would die by the war's conclusion. The story doesn't consider Rhaenyra a true ruler of the Seven Kingdoms, calling her Rhaenyra the Pretender and the Half-Year Queen. And Daemon spent the whole time on the battlefield, or cheating on his wife, far from his precious Iron Throne before he too died. A couple generations later, a similar situation within the Targaryen family would take place. About 65 years later, there would be another civil war, all for that sweet, sweet crown. Rhaenyra's grandson, King Aegon IV, would be one of the worst kings in the story's history. He planted the seeds of another civil war solely because he disagreed with his son and heir on his horrible ruling decisions. He was constantly popping out bastards with various women, and threatened to name one of them as his heir instead of his true-born son, Darren. That was just how Jabba the Hutt over here did things. A Targaryen heir is customarily supposed to be given the Valyrian steel sword called Blackfire, but King Aegon IV decided to give it to his most controversial bastard, a 12-year-old child named Daemon Waters, who he had with his cousin. At the same time, rumors were being spread by no other than King Aegon himself that Darren wasn't even one of his children. Daemon no longer kept the bastard named Waters, creating a house of his own called House Blackfire. Then on his deathbed, Aegon IV, nicknamed the Unworthy, made his worst call yet. He legitimized all of his bastards, even though he had an heir. A very dangerous thing to do because of the climate at court. This didn't stop Darren's coronation or anything, but a lot of people weren't happy with who the new king had around him. It all came down to them being racist. He was married to a Martell princess, and Dorne and the rest of the Seven Kingdoms didn't have the best relationship. So seeing all the Dornish men was a hot topic. Many who were around Daemon tried to convince him to claim the Iron Throne after their father died. Right before he started his rebellion, King Darren made the first move to try and apprehend him before any bloodshed could take place. But Daemon escaped and the Blackfire Rebellion would take place, with many lords backing his claim. But it wasn't enough, and he would die during this war. Daemon started House Blackfire, but after his death, his family had to get off the continent if they were going to live in comfort. His sons and their sons would continue these Blackfire Rebellions, and all would fail, with the OG Daemon coming the closest to the Iron Throne, even if it wasn't all that close. King Darren earned the nickname of Darren the Good through his respectable reign, and his firstborn son and heir shared in this reputation. His name was Baylor Targaryen, with the nickname Baylor Breakspear. He was on track to being equally successful king, but he died right before his father did, so he never got the chance to sit on the Iron Throne. They died in the same year, Baylor going first in a tourney accident, and Darren through a nasty epidemic. Heir after heir kept on dying before ever being crowned in this era, dwindling the Targaryen line even further after all the wars. In 233 AC, another great council would take place to decide who should inherit the Iron Throne after things got messy. Another Aegon, the fourth son of a fourth son, was the clear choice, but a lot of the nobles didn't like how much time he spent with the common folk while growing up. So they plotted to have Aemon Targaryen, his older brother, take the crown. Yep, the same Aemon we see in the current book story in On Game of Thrones. My father was Micah. The first of his name, my brother Egon, reigned after him when I had refused the throne. Because there were so many relatives ahead of Aemon in the line of succession when he was younger, King Darren sent Aemon away to the Citadel to become a maester because of the potential danger of too many Targaryen heirs. Just look at how much trouble it caused the Seven Kingdoms in the past. When the lords of the Great Council approached Aemon, he stuck to his maester's vows, not falling for the temptation of power. His will is just that strong. So his little brother Aegon V became the next king. Aegon's children all inherited his defiant personality. None of his sons followed through with their betrothal matches, 
and when his firstborn son and heir, Duncan, decided he wanted to marry a common girl he fell in love with, King Aegon gave him the ultimatum of marrying his love or continuing to be his heir. He chose love. Duncan could have sat on the Iron Throne, but valued the more important things in life. I like how George Martin incorporated some characters having a little interest in power. Makes it more realistic in my eyes. Aegon and Duncan would actually die in the same incident, together when their summer castle burned down after trying to hatch some dragon eggs. So good thing he let his younger brother be heir to the crown, cause he almost had neither. We all know that Robert Baratheon took the Targaryen seat away from them after the Mad King went way too far with his cruelty. The Mad King's son and Daenerys' older brother Rhaegar may have been plotting to remove his father from power. It wasn't just the Mad King's enemies that had issues with how he handled his rule. Rhaegar told Jaime Lannister, who was freshly appointed to the Kingsguard, that he would make changes after the rebellion was over, but he would never return from the battlefield thanks to Robert's Warhammer. Robert may have been drastically better than the Mad King, but that's not saying much. He wasn't a very good ruler, and even he knew it. He only kept his seat on the throne out of fear of what Joffrey might do in his place. Rhaegar would have been better off for the realm, and so would Robert's younger brother Stannis who is actually the true heir because Joffrey and his siblings aren't even Robert's kids. Stannis was one of the first to find out the truth, but withheld the information from his brother because he knew how it would look. Everyone would assume he was just trying to take the crown for himself. He had little support at court. Everyone found him unbearable. So did Robert. So Stannis went to the man Robert would trust and believe. His foster father and hand of the king, John Arryn. But John Arryn was killed before bringing the evidence forward. And that's where our story begins. There was a chance of Stannis being the rightful heir in everyone's eyes, but they took too long to act out of caution. Robert's a rash man who may have instantly butchered the Lannisters and the kids if he found out. And with his unhealthy lifestyle, Stannis would be on the Iron Throne soon enough. But Robert was taken out, and the younger Baratheon brother, Renly, wanted to complicate things by challenging all the so-called kings during the War of the Five Kings. Stannis almost got what was his by right, but didn't quite make it on the show. But his campaign continues in the books. So I was going in chronological order throughout the video, but I think an honorable mention for a character who almost sat on the Iron Throne is Jaime Lannister, which happened a little further back in time. Right at the end of Robert's Rebellion, before he was crowned, Jaime decided to kill the Mad King and for some reason walked up all the steps to sit on the Iron Throne, waiting for whoever would make it into the throne room next. He didn't sit on it with the intention of claiming it, he was just 17 and experienced something very traumatizing. Not like there was any other chair around, he needed a seat. He didn't think it through, because he just killed a man he swore to protect for the sake of the city, but no one would ever see it like that. A pair of judgmental eyes walked into the throne room and witnessed a Lannister sitting on the Iron Throne, a pretty serious offense. It happened to be Ned Stark, who didn't like what he saw. He tells Robert in the first book, I never said a word. I looked at him seated there on the throne, and I waited. At last, Jimmy laughed and got up. He took off his helm and he said to me, Have no fear, Stark. I was only keeping it warm for our friend Robert. It's not a very comfortable seat, I'm afraid. But classic Robert just laughed it off. Somehow, Bran Stark of all characters ended up on this chair by the end of Game of Thrones. We'll have to wait and see if George Martin has other plans for his story whenever the next two books comes out. These videos always twist and turn into much longer explanations as I keep digging through the material, but I hope you guys still enjoyed it. I'll be back soon with something else to talk about. Thanks for watching.